you know, Uniswap has been trying for five years to build a fully on-chain DEX that is sustainable and competitive, and they couldn't figure it out, so they're hoping someone else will figure it out through these through these APIs and this lower cost of innovation. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Zero X Research, brought to you by the Atom Accelerator. If you're a developer looking for a home in the industry, the Atom Economic Zone welcomes you. Today is July 31st, and as always, we have a great interview lined up with Eugene, the co-founder of Ellipsis Labs, the development team that's bringing in next-gen central limit order book decks to Solana. Um, but before we do that, we are joined today by Ren and Westy to discuss the latest market happenings. Dan, why don't I kick it over to you for the hot seat or cool throne? Yeah, we uh, we definitely have some latest market happenings this week. Unfortunately, I'm finding myself, of all people, putting Curve in the hot seat. Uh, so Curve on a couple of days, well, I, don't know, I mean, I'm totally lo- like lost track of time over the past couple hours, but uh, within the last 24 hours, and again, we're recording this on, on Monday the 31st, uh, Curve suffered a re-entrancy exploit for around $70 million. Um, and really quickly on re-entrancy exploits. So this has been an attack that's kind of plagued DeFi and smart contracts since the early days. The Actually, the original DAO exploit that ended up forking Ethereum between Ethereum Classic and the Ethereum we know today uh, was actually due to a re-entrancy attack. And what that really means is, so when you call a smart contract, um, let's say you're like withdrawing liquidity uh, from maybe a specific pool, uh, you really want to go through like what's known as the checks effects intera- interactions pattern. And so basically when the way the code will be sequentially written in this function would be to like validate all the conditions that are necessary uh, to execute properly. So maybe like make sure in the case of withdrawing liquidity that the user has actually deposited funds into that. Uh, step two would be then the effects piece of this. So you're going to update the contract state uh, and record any changes made to any of the data or any state changes. Uh, and then lastly, you'd actually perform the action. So, you know, perform any calls that need to be made. Uh, and if like things aren't done in that specific order, then you can like reduce this, re- introduce this idea of re-entrancy, uh, where basically before the funds are actually moved, uh, the attacking contract can basically like call back into the, the victim contract um, and like essentially get stuck in like a loop until all the funds in, a, in the case of withdrawing liquidity have been withdrawn from the pool. Um, and so specific to the case with Curve, uh, it's a little bit more unique than just a vanilla re attack. So the code itself was actually written correctly by the Curve developers, uh, which is actually why this one stings a little more. It's, it was actually an issue with the underlying programming language that caused this re So basically they had um, what's called like a reentrancy guard. So uh, another function that will like essentially protect reentrancy from occurring. They had that in this contract. Um, it actually was broken. So they had like a, effectively a broken guard uh, in in the case of these contracts, and it was it had something to do with like the uh, versioning of the compiler that was used to compile the code into bytecode, and so. Um, really tough to see, but one thing to note here is that Curve uses, the, there's that development community uses a specific smart contracting language that's called Viper. Uh, it's based on Python, the, uh, the more popular uh, coding language that many people are probably familiar with, at least the name, if nothing else. Um, and so they use this like smaller, more uh, alternative coding language that, you know, it's probably a net positive to have uh, some smart contracting language diversity uh, within the ecosystem. Because uh, you could really imagine like if everything was written in Solidity and say Solidity had a similar exploit, to be honest, I don't even know if that's possible. Um, but let's just assume for a second it did. Then having some diversity in the languages used to write smart contracts would be a net positive. So that's kind of the idea, I think. Um, it's also just like in a more comfortable language to use as many people are familiar with how Python is written and how uh, the language operates. Uh, but net net, we landed with this issue creating about a $70 million loss in terms of the exploit for Curve. Um, Now, it seems likely that some of this was actually collected by White Hats instead of the exploiters themselves. Uh, It looks like roughly $20 million. It's kind of just too early to call on what the specific amount will be. Uh, We saw a lot of interesting cases with front running. So um, MEV bots actually kind of came to Curve's benefit. One of the MEV bots is named Coffee Babe, uh, and she front ran one of the later exploits uh, that actually was resulted in around like about eight or so million dollars. Uh, and there's 
there's already been some communications between the curve deployer address and coffee bay of saying like you know yes i'm willing to return these funds like let's let's coordinate a, a recovery um so there will be at least some funds recovered uh the the bigger takeaway i guess here is you know the grand scheme of thing 70 million dollars isn't huge for a protocol that has about 1.7 billion dollars of tvl uh it's more so the loss of trust that we will have to like kind of overcome from this and again the fact that it was like with the smart contract programming language itself that one stings a little bit more that's like a little bit more nerve-wracking it's like how quite honestly i'm just like not technical enough to know like how like the root of that how like how how that gets drawn out how it gets fixed like what are the odds of it happening again like to me that's you know when you say an issue with the compiler like i know very high surface level what a compiler does <laughs> so um that's just like a bit harder for me to wrap my head around and so that's kind of the exploit itself and where it's at. It's it's kind of a shame in terms of timing because Curve has just launched its stablecoin and lending market and it's getting some pretty meaningful traction with around $100 million of CRV USD debt outstanding. Um, it seems like those contracts are totally fine at the moment at least. Um, but again, those are also written in Viper, but it seems to be a version not impacted by the specific bug. And so there's some interesting knock-on effects here we can dive into, but I don't know, I guess I should open the floor here. And, you know, I'm kind of curious to get your thoughts. Like this is an OG DeFi protocol that kind of was viewed as, you know, one of these safe haven places. Um, so like, how do you guys feel about seeing, you know, one of these major players go through like a very unique bug? I don't think we've seen a compiler bug like this before. At least both for us and both for slightly more chat fi institutions if you're running like a large crypto hedge fund traditionally you and i all know like the DeFi blue chips like synthetics maker uni curve and that entire curve ecosystem and those have always been the protocols that you don't really need to go look at their smart contract audits you say okay i'm comfortable doing whatever i'm comfortable swapping through these protocols or interacting with these protocols and we still know that DeFi to this day is run by a huge amount of whales, right? For example, I think like more than 80% of liquidity in every single uni who is held by 10 people, if I'm not wrong. Um, and if something like Curve is exploitable, I think it makes you wonder, right? Like most of us aren't like tech people. Most hedge fund managers probably also are tech people, but they're also wondering. If curve is success is if curve is susceptible, then who else is kind of open waiting to be exploited out there? You know, just that loss of trust, I think it's going to be pretty negative to the ecosystem. And I wouldn't be surprised if you are like tracking some large whale wallets right now and you're just seeing them pull out of protocols other than curve too. Yeah, I mean, I guess we're recording this at like max pain time. It's not even like 24 hours since we really uh, kind of like understand what's happening. So it's still like very raw for all of us. So keep that in mind if we, uh, some of the facts change before this episode releases. Uh, but it is interesting to see the knock on effects here. So um, her founder, Michael Agarov is highly levered against the CRV token. Um, for better, for worse, or for why that reason is, is kind of speculation. But the reality of it is, is there's about $63 million borrowed in USDT against Aave uh, and about $17 million of Frax through Fraxland. Now, obviously, when there's an exploit, the token price tends to react negatively. And given the risk around this, we've also seen it's like a compounding effect, right? So we have the collateral asset CRV decreasing in value. At the same time, you know, this has kind of been a hotly debated topic for a couple of months now. So people are aware of the issue of like there's a lack of liquidity around curve. And the deepest on chain liquidity pool was the CRV ETH curve pool. That was one of the exploited pools. So now we like lost the best place to liquidate any assets, uh, any CRV assets specifically through any on-chain pool. Um, of course, there's still like some other fairly decent options, but that was the the top dog for in terms of liquidity and like maybe two percent depth. Um, so we have the collateral asset depre depreciating in value, the loss of liquidity for the token, uh, and the both Fraxland and Aave are like variable rate interest markets based on the amount of utilization for the borrowed asset, which uh, in the case of Aave is USDT and Frax for Fraxland. Both of the lenders have basically like, you've seen large withdrawals, people being like, I don't want to be the last one holding the bag here. I'm pulling out some of the assets that I've deposited. And because of that, the utilization rate is running higher. 
when utilization rate runs higher, you see an increase in the interest rates. So now there's like, you have the interest rate rapidly increasing, pushing up the total amount of borrow as the collateral is falling. And again, we lost the liquidity to liquidate positions into. So you have this like triple compounding effect of like, oh shit, there might actually be some major knock on effects of this. Um, the Both of these do at the moment have pretty high health factors around 1.5 ish, a little higher than that for the Ave one. Um, but we are seeing it looks like if one was going to get liquidated first, it's likely to be the Fraxland one because that position, um, Fraxland has a pretty interesting uh, interest rate model where there really is no upper bound until about 10,000 APR. And the way the model works is like it effectively doubles every four hours or so when the utilization is at 100%, I believe. Uh, and so like this thing is utilization right now, I think is like 96%. So about like every six or eight hours, you're seeing a double in the interest rate, which is currently up to like 46, 47% last I looked. Um, so if that goes, there'll be, you know, whatever's left at that point in time in terms of collateral that needs to get liquidated to keep that position solvent. So if that one triggers, I imagine you'd see the second one trigger through Ave and I, I, uh, there's a pretty good likelihood that Ave gets stuck holding the bag of, of bad debt here. Um, so we have it like it's like just this chain daisy chain reaction of, of bad things, right? Because if Ave gets stuck with bad debt, then the users that are in the staking module would be open to like sort of filling that back debt uh, unless they use like protocol reserves. And again, it like very much so matters at the size of the bad debt that Ave is left with um, if anything could be done here. So again, still very too early to call it, but there are some very important knock on effects here to be monitoring. Yeah, I've also noticed, like, basically, as we're speaking, Igorov is selling his LDO tokens at like $10,000 a clip, which is probably him hoping to recover some funds to then pay back these loans before the interest rates get too high and he does get liquidated. So, yeah, I, I mean, I look at these not second order effects, these knock on effects, and it does look like if nothing's done, a liquidation is going to be likely. And as a result, like, hopefully we get a resolve to the situation soon because. Yeah, this could have second order effects for for Ave for for Fraxland, um, and it's just something you don't want to see. I think one interesting thing that I'm thinking about is if you're Fraxland or your Frax or and your Ave, you are like the governance token holders. What do you want to do? Because say say you kind of acknowledge that it's over, <laughs> like this guy's gonna get liquidated somewhere, and there's only so much liquidity between these two lending and borrowing protocols or whatever, like lending and borrowing protocols that Mitch has a position on, you don't want to be the last person liquidating his position. If anything, you want to be the first person, uh, but none of his positions on any of these protocols have crossed a sort of liquidation threshold yet. So do you kind of break and force a liquidation just to avoid protocol bad debt, or you just let the markets do its thing and kind of see how it plays out? I think it's an interesting thing that governance token holders are considering right now. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I think I actually misspoke. I, I said it doubled every four hours. I think it doubles every 12 hours. Nonetheless, <laughs> it is increasing at a rapid pace, uh, specifically as it relates to the Fraxland pool. Um, so yeah, like, uh, it'd be a real shame if this exploit like daisy chained into DeFi imploding. Um, but again, maybe that's just the, the harsh, reaction given that it's it's less than 24 hours old in my mind hate to see it though like curve was on such a great pace and they're doing such great things uh really like that's why it sucks that we're seeing like this huge leverage thing pay out play out because you know largely i think now like okay the exploit is passed it wasn't great but i don't think it's the end of the world but now like you're gonna see people hunt this position that's like the downside of having everything fully transparent you can quickly do some math and figure out what the liquidation value is or the, the liquidation point for this fraction loan is. And like, it's going to get chased. So just like just how these things work, um, which I think it's about 33, 34 cents for CRV um, given the current market conditions. But again, interest rates climbing, which pushes that liquidation point higher, which makes it happen sooner. So I don't know, man, it uh, doesn't feel good right now. That is for sure. Yeah. I saw a tweet from Rune. Uh, created maker who said this might be sort of like the Black Thursday moment of this cycle and that DeFi will bounce back as a result. And I'm hoping that's the case. I'm feeling that's the case that like after sort of this washes, 
washes away that you know there really is no negative uh occurrences on on the horizon so DeFi can sort of flourish from there does anyone have any possible guesses as to why egrov is so levered on his protocols native token like that's the one thing that i just cannot for the life of me try and understand why why would he do that like if if that if those positions aren't open this isn't even a thing like we're not talking about this for 20 minutes on the intro like that yes it would still be bad but now it's kind of got the potential to turn into something so much worse so i don't know if anyone has any theories there but i'd love to hear them i've heard that um australia's weather is quite nice and the real estate market keeps on going up so um <laughs> But on, on a more serious note, I think I think if you're a founder and you're holding your protocol's native token, or if in the case of sort of slightly more web to trad fi company, you're holding your company's equity, you don't really want to sell that because like that's just a bad look in general. And one thing that rich people do really really well is make their assets efficient. You know, they borrow where they can. They access financing opportunities that normies like you and me can't access. And that's one way they compound their wealth. So rather than setting his curve, you know, he's borrowing USDT and whatever he's doing with his USDT is kind of like none of our business. But as, as an example, right, the founder of Peloton at one point, like this guy was giga loaded. He borrowed against his stock to go buy his private jet, to go buy his houses. You know, if it keeps going up, and you don't get liquidated, fine. But obviously, Peloton is not doing so well these days. So one day, if I'm not wrong, Goldman Sachs comes knocking on his door and say, "Hey, we're gonna have to liquidate you. We're gonna have to call back your private jet, your house." I mean, when it goes up, it's fine. Um, but when it goes down, I think that's kind of bad. And I think most people, when they borrow against their assets, I don't want to say they get greedy, or they're probably like a bit optimistic. And they borrow against it into like a liquid assets, like purchasing real estate or whatever. And that means you can't just pay back your loan like within a day or two. Yeah, I'd agree with that, Rand, on your your last half there. Um, you know, like, look, if he if we make it out of this and like whatever reason curve price recovers and life is good and you know bear market kicks in in a couple quarters and resume resume up only, then yeah, he made max efficiency with the assets he had and like you know it's is it. If you just dumped the same amount of CRV tokens, like you'd be like, oh, the founder's quitting on the protocol. Like that wouldn't really work. So that's like almost not an option. Um, obviously, being in the tokenomic style that Curve has, the CRV price is fairly important to its future incentives and the attractiveness of the protocol. So again, dumping the CRV tokens really wasn't an option there either. Um, so like this was basically his his exit. I don't think that in a malicious way. I think like that was just a way to get liquidity and you know, it's like you got to anytime you open leverage, like you're writing a fine line. And so that's just kind of uh, where we're at right now. Yeah, that's a good take, I guess, too. Like the curve devs, like out of any team, I feel like they value decentralization and like really sticking to the ethos of crypto more than most groups out there. So I guess kind of reaping what you sow and taking out loans and Aave kind of supporting, I guess, just the broader Ethereum DeFi ecosystem might have been a, a an angle there as well. But Anyways, on to more uh, happy topics. Let's. Who's got a cool throne for today? Who wants to go next? I got a cool throne. Um, so MakerDAO a few months back voted on their die savings rate. They increased it from some negligible number to three point four nine percent. Earlier they earlier this month they toned it down a little. Or they reduced it to three point one nine percent. But a recent governance vote just went through that basically proposes a new thing called the effective die savings rate and that's basically when the amount of die being deposited into that the die savings rate vault is low they'll sort of use all of that income and sort of concentrate it into whoever has deposited into the die savings vault but kind of like the frax eve model that kind of um but basically when the vault is at a zero percent utilization you get an eight percent interest rate um just some extra numbers when the utilization is 50%, you get a 4.16%. And right now, the utilization of the vault is around 10%. There's around 360 million in the vault and 4.5 billion in outstanding die supply. So, I mean, this interest rate could be pretty good if you deposit it by now. I want to say like 6 7% compared to the current reserve rate of 
5.25 to 5.5%. And I think that that's a growing trend that we've seen lately in crypto, right? Like, I want to make every token capital efficient in the sense that if I can make an interest-bearing version of it, I'm going to make an interest-bearing version of it. And I'm going to make this interest rate as high as possible. Um, but yeah, basically the whole goal of this is to grow the demand for DAI and the DAI savings rate to ensure a growing user base that's ready when MakerDAO sort of launches all of their sub DAOs and participate in the whole end game plan. My, my only concern of this is that within crypto, this becomes part of a larger movement to chase yield. And historically, that hasn't ended well for TradFi when everyone starts chasing yield and starts taking on more risk. So we'll see. But so far, it seems like their reward asset portfolio is decently stable in the grand scheme of things, and it should be pretty stable for us the time being. No, I like the move here. I think the the DSR as a whole is a really exciting development. I think like we need to get off chain yields on chain. That's that seems straightforward to me. I definitely probably flipped my position from maybe twelve months ago where I uh, I was. I was like, no, we're going to build our own on-chain ecosystem and we don't need to rely on off-chain yields. And while that's probably true in the long term, I think there's no reason not to try to pull uh, these long existing institutional yields on chain. I think that's really exciting. Um, I have a lot of opinions about how that's going to happen, but nonetheless, it's exciting to see Maker kind of using this interesting proxy with with uh, the DSR rate. So um, we talked to Sam McPherson a couple months ago, and he like talked about how the DSR will change DeFi. One thing that we haven't seen happen is we ha- like crypto is not efficient. That's the TLDR here. But we haven't seen like, for example, you can borrow uh, Dai on Aave and just stake it into the Dai savings rate and earn that yield. Um, and based on the current bar rate, you get like a one one point two percent spread, which obviously is not huge, but you would think that, that would have closed by now. You know, it's been a couple a couple of months live. So I think like the goal here uh, is really just to like kind of put the DSR and the, the like the ability to earn that, like put that into the forefront here. Um, they t- took a very interesting approach with how they're going to get this in. So it's kind of like this one direction, one uh, this. Yeah, like unidirectional uh, process where once the utilization of the savings rate like eclipses a certain uh, percentage, then the die savings rate will like decrease, uh, essentially getting back down to that three ish percent range. Um, but stablecoin yield at like eight or so percent when this thing first launches is pretty attractive. So I do think we're going to see a, a meaningful move into it. A second order effect of this that I'm like curious to see play out. I, I can't verify the accuracy of this, so please, like, I, I saw a tweet about it five minutes ago before we were recording this. So definitely go check this out, make sure it's right. But um, I guess I saw Richard Hart from the founder of Hex and Pulse Chain and all that. He has like 700 million in die or something, which is like a meaningful percentage uh, supply, a percent of the total supply. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Like. Why does he have so much die? I guess, you know, he probably wants something that can't be blacklisted like USDC or USDT. Um, I don't know, man. That That's just a cool random thing I, I saw with die. So I definitely need to verify that. Yeah. Another thing with the DSR is it's almost like, like you said, bringing off chain yields on chain. And there are other ways the protocols are doing this, but it's usually through like some KYC system like Ondo Finance, like bringing the treasury yields on chain, but you have to KYC, give your information. Whereas I think having uh, a proxy via DAI and via its lending protocol, I think this is just a better way to have like more permissionless access to to these off-chain yields. So I I, I also agree that this is a great way to grow the DAI supply and I think it's going to be very attractive. I can take it over for my hot seat for the week. I've got a Lido dual token governance in there. So I actually said before the merge that I thought, or sorry, yeah, before the merge that uh, I thought the Lido dominance rate amongst staked ETH would go down just because it's hard to keep up that percentage dominance in absolute terms when you're already absolutely huge. But we're still chilling at 32%. And it's been what, 10 months, nine months, something like that since the merge. So um, there's kind of resurfacing conversations that uh, got brought up in June of last year of giving Steeth holders the LST um, of Lido itself, <clears throat> the ability to uh, veto governance uh, proposals in Lido governance. So I don't really know how I feel about this, to be honest, because without um, Steeth holders, you really don't have any value for LDO. So like, uh, yeah, I don't really know. 
Um, and then on top of it, like values only value proposition, Lido's only value proposition, sorry, is pretty much to be active in governance today. Um, you know, you think maybe at some point in the future, they turn on some type of fee switch, but even their revenues aren't massive today by looking at the, in relation to the, uh, the, the multiples that LDO trades at based on current revenue, because they only get 5% of the um, 6% staking yield on all the AUM. So it's actually a lot smaller number than a lot of people think. Um, and I also think like in general, LST providers, like, yes, it's not great to have one have 32% market share, but at the same time, they help client diversity. It's better than having large centralized exchanges hold all the ETH supply. Um, so I, I don't know if it's really all that necessary. I personally believe that the, the Lido dominance is a little bit overblown. Um, so yeah, I don't know. What do you guys think of it? Yeah, this has been in the works for a long time now. I think you said June of last year. And it's something that I've always been a huge fan of. I mean, there's a big contention within a portion of the ETH community that like Lido having 32% market share in all ETH staked is a problem and it's continuing to grow and that they should self-limit in some way. Um, and a lot of these concerns come around, obviously one entity having control of that much stake. Obviously people on the other side say, well, if you look at how their stake is structured, there's many different entities and they're adding DVT and, and ways to basically decentralize their or operator base in a way that it's really not one entity. But at the same time, if you have one token that governs all of the staked ETH, you really do have centralizing power in that way. And so having the ability to have Steeth holders who are more so aligned with the Ethereum protocol than they are allowed of the DAO, that allowing them veto power that if there's a governance proposal that obviously negatively affects Ethereum as a protocol and therefore Steeth holders that they're going to do the job and, and veto that proposal. Like I think having having them have this power where, where maybe they can't vote on proposals, but at the very least they can provide a backstop, I think is a, is a really good idea and helps Lido to like sort of self-limit in a way that allows them to maintain large market share while remaining decentralized and, and good for Ethereum. I think one interesting point about DeFi is Everyone kind of say DeFi is very composable, right? And in an ideal world, like just crypto as a whole is decentralized. But part of me thinks that because DeFi itself is so composable, and that means kind of network effects are amplified in a permissionless and open manner, right? That kind of ends up leading to sort of more monopolizing forces than perhaps like if the same thing were to happen in like web two or like outside of crypto i don't know if that's a slightly controversial take but it's just like a random thought i had yeah it'll definitely be interesting to watch this play out i mean lido will be will be with us throughout the thick and thin of DeFi, so definitely rooting for him i just don't really understand though like like if ldo token holders ultimately vote on something that's negative for ethereum then the value of the ldo token goes down already so the incentives are already relatively aligned in my opinion but I guess, yeah, if you have the, the Steeth veto power, like, like whatever, like they're supposed to be aligned anyways. So what's it hurt? It's not like they're going to just veto things willy, willy nilly. So I guess I'm with you, Estia. I liked your take. Who you got in the hot seat or cool throne though? Yeah, absolutely. Can finish this off here. It wouldn't be a week of Xerox research without Coinbase and in the cool throne, but this time it's their new L2 base. So they just launched this week for anyone to bridge funds over. And they had over $200 million in daily DEX volume over the past 24 hours, which is higher than any chain besides Ethereum and Binance Smart Chain, although Arbitrum is pretty close. And of course, since the chain's only been live for a week, uh, this is mostly a result of copy and paste DEX protocols and meme coin speculation, most of all. The most popular of these meme coins was, of course, called Bald. Uh, which was up over 8,000% in just 24 hours uh, before being deployed. But of course, um, right as sort of the bridge, it was a one-way bridge up until early this morning. And as soon as the two-way bridge was enacted, uh, the deployer of Bald uh, basically bridged over a bunch of ETH to, to make it look like he was about to buy more Bald and put up the price and basically bait people into buying more Bald before rugging the liquidity um, but yeah, it was definitely a fun weekend. If you're paying attention, it feels like in crypto, you, if you blink, you're going to miss another hundred X opportunity, 
even in this bear market. And this is just another one of them. Um, yeah, so I'm wondering, what do you guys think about all the base speculation that was going on? Did you guys bridge over? I didn't bridge over myself, but I think it's just kind of a funny story in how crypto is so unique. Like, for example, if you're bringing a consulting company, right, and you tell them, okay, I have this platform, I want to sort of like grow its adoption and get meaningful user metrics, like what should I do? They're going to come back and it's like, oh, you know, like social media ads, like have people building on it. And then someone launches a meme coin called Vault and it's probably 10 times more successful than whatever plan they may have come up with. Or even probably like the build on basis team own plan. Like I'm sure they had like a nice, like fancy, like, Oh, today base is going live on mainnet for our users. Here's the 10 list of protocols that we'll be supporting on day one. And chances are that's probably not going to be successful as whatever happened over the weekend. So I just think that's very funny and unique to crypto. I think the second thing is I'm not really sh very sure whether the bridge was like truly one way. I think there was like a way to call the smart contract and you get your funds withdrew after uh, seven days. But most people didn't know that. I think um, like the whole of yesterday, it was just like 10,000 threads on my timeline saying, oh, you know, here's how you bridge the base. It's a one way bridge. You send your funds to like 0x49, blah, 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 whatever. And I think the takeaway I had from that was that basically like no one cares about decentralization or like sequence of life. You, know? you have like these like VCs, these like info guys saying like, oh, I, I have to call out uh, but Big Boss Mike here and he's saying like, oh, you know, like Ethereum is like not decentralized because uh, the sequencers are centralized, blah, blah, blah. Like there's no sequencer likeness, but like 99% of people that bridge the base yesterday, I guarantee you did not care. Like you could have told them that the bridge was locked for say like two weeks or one month. And I guarantee you still would have seen like the $50 million of info. And I just think that's hilarious. I think the the counter argument there would be the type of user that bridged yesterday is incredibly specific that is like someone who's comfortable being on chain and is going with one purpose and that is to chase meme coins so like that user i couldn't agree more does not care <laughs> um but i do think like you know if you're going over there to use like a lending protocol or you know perform some financial action like yeah and then maybe like that's the kind of user that would probably care a little more rather than you know just a degenerate gambler um not that there's anything wrong with that but that's just two different types of users that uh have different preferences so uh, i tend to think that the at least in the medium to long term like the person that does care is probably a larger group uh i don't know that's actually a great question like the more or less people care in in some of people who like use a blockchain I, I actually don't know i gotta try and pull the receipts but i said on zero x research like two or three months ago i was like i bet alt season on base is gonna be insane because there's literally nothing else to speculate on and i love that it actually panned out i bet it's gonna get even crazier but uh yeah just the fact that that many that amount of money flowed over there without incentivization is is pretty insane and i'm really really excited for like the official mainnet to open up because I, I'm just really intrigued to see how much money goes over there just to try it out because we really haven't seen like any type of organic, non-incentivized behavior in crypto. And I think everyone's super, super excited about base. Um, but yeah, I mean, just wild stuff. I can't like it's part of me is like, man, like we deserved this curve exploit. Like, look at what we're doing right now. We're just trading bald on a, <laughs> a place that's basically a black box where we can't get out of like. It's just crazy sometimes when I step back for a minute and really look at the state of things. I'm coming home from a nice relaxing beach vacation and I checked Slack and it's like the curve exploit, like at Dan, what's going on? Like, is this curve Armageddon? I'm like, dude, come on. I'm literally driving on the highway right now. This is a terrible time for this. And then I like pull over, you know, get gas or whatever, figure out curves getting fucked. And I'm like, this is terrible. And then I like scroll through Twitter for five seconds. And it's like, you know, people making millions of dollars off of a $500 purchase of bald. And I'm like, man, it is two ends of the spectrum. On one side, you just have pure degenerate gamblers absolutely crushing. And on the other side, you have like gigabrain devs trying to, you know, front run the black hats before they can continue their exploit. Like to Ren's point, like this is just such a unique industry, man. It's for better or for worse, it's it's fun to be here. There's no doubt about it. And I'm not fucking leaving. 
<laughs> love to hear that. Love the enthusiasm. Dan, you want to tell people what's good with uh, the Atom Accelerator? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, as always, love to give a shout out to the great Atom Accelerator for sponsoring our show. If you're a developer looking for a home in the industry, come build in the Atom Economic Zone. Interchain security gives you the ability to launch with the economic security of the Cosmos Hub rather than trying to bootstrap your own economic security. IBC gives you the ability to interop with other chains already building in the ecosystem. You know, we've seen like Duality and stride really take advantage of this and uh, kind of like helping push forward development within the atom economic zone uh, noble is going to bring native usdc into the ecosystem and really kickstart DeFi by having that uh, native unit of account and that uh, ability to be have a stable coin right people love stability especially uh, in the heat of a bear market so if you think that you have an idea that could help the atom economic zone it would like to get looking uh, if you like to look for funding to help kickstart that idea the atom accelerator is doing grants on a rolling monthly basis ranging from ten thousand to one million dollars be sure to check out the link in the show notes for more information on how to get in in touch with that team. Uh, but now on to the awesome interview with Eugene from Ellipsis Labs. All right, we're joined by Eugene uh, from Ellipsis Labs, the development team behind a Solana-based order book decks called Phoenix. Thanks for coming on, Eugene. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I was hoping we could just kind of get right into it and get an overview from your perspective of you know, what Phoenix is and, and why you decided to build it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Phoenix is a spot limit order book decks on Solana. It's fully on-chain, so there's no off-chain component whatsoever. The matching engine, all the limit orders, the order book, um, all lives fully on-chain. Um, you know, we we started working on Phoenix as a result of a couple of things. First of all, I think, uh, you know, Serum originally was this limit order book DEX on Solana. It was actually one of the first applications put on Solana, and it really showed why having a high throughput, low fee, short block uh, blockchain enabled much more in DeFi, much more efficient protocol designs than what we see on other blockchains that are much more constrained on the performance side. Um, but Serum is sort of not under active development for like two and a half years. There's some fundamental architectural things that are uh, you know wrong with it, where if you're building on Solana in 2020, I think there's just a lot of uh, knowledge that's kind of common today that wasn't really understood back then. I think uh, Serum was always sort of supposed to be this V0 kind of proof of concept type thing, and we're really productionizing that today. So we have gone and taken, uh, well, we've written, we've written the entire order book from from scratch. We've really focused on the market maker developer experience, so making sure that their interfaces are as as clean as possible, uh, fixing some of the core issues around uh, settlement. So settlement is now fully atomic and a bunch of other quality of life improvements. Okay, I see. And why did you choose Solana over maybe like an ETHL2 or a Cosmos app specific chain? Like what is it that's unique about Solana in particular that you're like, all right, this is the best spot to build a, a limit order book on? The thing that is unique about Solana today is really just the high throughput and the low fees. Um, when we started the company, so we're not religious about infrastructure. We're not religious about what blockchain we build on on top of. And when we started the company, all we really knew is that we wanted to build financial primitives that are fully on chain that don't currently exist. And we did a pretty thorough survey of the infrastructure that was available at the time. Uh, looking at the L2s, uh, I think they have a pretty promising roadmap, but there's still a lot to execute on, including um, decentralizing the sequencer, implementing fraud proofs uh, or permissionless fraud proofs. And the throughput is still just not high enough and the fees are still too high. I think after EIP 4844, they'll probably still be maybe an order of magnitude, maybe a little bit worse than that, um, too high to support active liquidity on an order book. Uh, and then the app chain question is an interesting one as well. Uh, we really wanted to build for spot liquidity as opposed to derivatives liquidity. And I think for a derivatives liquidity um, or for a derivatives exchange, it makes a lot of sense to be on an app chain. You sort of bridge one time. You only have one asset you really care about, which is whatever base asset you denominate all of your perpetuals in. 
Uh, and I think it makes a lot less sense for Spot, where kind of the idea is you'd have to be bridging in all these different types of assets because uh, they're not going to be native to your app chain. You're going to sacrifice atomic composability, which, you know, when we ask, when we actually get to the question of why does liquidity need to be on chain, I think a big part of the answer is um, this demand for atomic composability, which we haven't seen yet today, but I think in a world where crypto and DeFi flourish, we should see a lot of demand for atomically composable liquidity. And so that all points to being on a monolithic blockchain as opposed to an app chain. I want to dive a little deeper into that, right? Because there's kind of been this narrative coming about that's like, uh, you know, atomic composability is pretty overrated. And, you know, that all gets stat arbed away anyways. But that's like really coming at it from the MEV lens. Um, but what you're talking about seems to be more like, okay, well, why are we coming at it from that lens? Like there might actually be new use cases that can be derived from from having that composability between applications. And that obviously ends up benefiting, benefiting the end user. Is that kind of how you're thinking about atomic composability? Yeah, exactly. Um, I agree completely on the MEV side. I think when this cross-chain MEV narrative started to pick up about a year ago, I have some tweet from probably last August that said, yeah, cross-chain atomicity or cross-chain MEV is overrated. It's all it's all basically going to be stat arb in the same way that on Ethereum mainnet today, most of the MEV isn't this uh, Uniswap, Sushi Swap, atomic arbitrage, actually, Uniswap versus Binance. And that's done in this non-atomic way, obviously. And I think the same will be true for uh, cross-chain MEV. You're not going to see too much optimism, arbitrum, DEX MEV, you're going to see Optimism Binance and Binance Arbitrum. Um, but when we talk about use cases, first of all, this is all highly speculative because I think like no one can really say with too much confidence what the dominant use cases are going to be. And I think that really does end up informing the infrastructure choices that we make. So one of like this big one of these big bets we've made with this company or at least developing this particular protocol is like yeah spot liquidity is going to be important and it has to be on a monolithic blockchain because there's going to be demand for atomic composability and i think the shape of the the shape of this demand can you know look pretty different in in different futures uh, one example is a lot of fi- let's say a lot of finance moves on chain um and you have a lot of financial products that tap into a bunch of different protocols on chain. Maybe that's exposed to the user, maybe it's not. Uh, you can imagine that some of these atomic actions end up uh, hitting uh, many different protocols, perhaps in like a, a single transaction or a single uh, larger, larger action. And then you can also imagine a bunch of other types of applications that make it fully on chain that are somewhat financialized that end up with some sort of trading component where you do need to have this um liquidity that is that is fully on chain this is pretty similar to this like og DeFi, maybe not og but this like 2020 vision that was articulated for DeFi, which is you're going to have these on chain fully on chain right transparent uh composable DeFi legos DeFi building blocks we still believe in this vision i think a lot of others in crypto have kind of kind of given up on it uh i think especially when you're so limited by the infrastructure, there's just not that much you can do. And so coming over to the Solana side, which is not where my you know crypto background is from, is sort of this breath of fresh air, where all of a sudden, all these like super heavy constraints that are on you as a protocol developer are just gone. And, you know, they're replaced with a different set of constraints, of course, and there's uh, all sorts of other problems. Uh, we are still quite early on, on the infrastructure side. But as a DeFi protocol designer, there's just like so much more you can do when you don't have to deal with like 10, 20 TPS. You don't have to deal with every transaction is going to cost you at least five bucks, but usually significantly more. Yeah, I, I want to. I feel there's two different directions you can take this now. But you know, you mentioned the technical constraints of building on maybe like Ethereum, for example, and uh, I want to get your thoughts on how that influenced your decision to go CLOB versus AMM, because on Ethereum, obviously, we see uh, some increasingly complex AMM designs, but you know we haven't really found like the silver bullet that could probably like outperform a CLOB. So uh, can you dive into like you know a why how, where you think the AMM versus CLOB debate is at, and you know b what 
exactly what constraints are maybe lifted when you're building in, in Solana that it kind of enables more innovation? Yeah, let me start with the second question. How does the high throughput and low fees enable innovation? It sort of allows this active participation in the market that is still going to be somewhat cost effective. So as an example, today on Phoenix, we will see on a single market, anywhere from like five to 10 uh, updates on a market, which is like placing a new limit order or canceling an order or some trade goes through, we'll see like five to 10 of those every second. And we're still in the very early stages here. So we expect that number to go up pretty significantly uh, as the markets become more competitive and as more users come on. This is just not possible on a chain that does 10 or 20 TPS. You just are not going to have 10 TPS going through a single DEX. Or if you are, the the cost is going to be prohibitive. So our market makers who are updating the orders, I believe every half second, sometimes every second, they're paying on the order of like $20 per day uh, for gas, which is like the cost of one add liquidity or remove liquidity on Uniswap v3. So when we think about the design space, uh, it just is so much more open because we're not constrained by these by these heavy costs. Uh, and I think a lot of the like when, when you think about like why did AMMs get developed in the first place, they were born out of this constraint, right? No one in 2017 or 2018 when AMMs were coming around uh, thought that, oh yeah, you know, all else equal, the AMM is a superior design to what exists on the centralized exchanges, but this is kind of an approximation and there are kind of some interesting properties uh, of this X, Y equals K thing we put it on chain, but most importantly, you can support this passive liquidity versus active liquidity. And so you don't need your market makers to be updating their quotes super frequently. It's just, you set it and forget it. And I think that really was quite innovative. Uh, and it does make a lot of sense for this uh, 10, 20 TPS train. And uni v3 is another pretty significant improvement over the, the XY equals K AMM. But you end up in the situation where the liquidity itself is just not that competitive with limit order books that exist off chain. And so this is why for pretty much all of the trading pairs that Binance has listed or Coinbase has listed or any of the other centralized exchanges, the price discovery is not happening on chain. The price discovery is happening uh, on these venues that don't have 12 second block times where market makers can put the liquidity exactly where they want to rather than uh, being so constrained by the the preference space that you're uh, allowed to uh, choose from when you're providing liquidity on an AMM. And so, I mean, I think like the limit order book looks very different when it's on chain. There are like a ton of concerns with MEV and discrete block times in the same way that these are pretty big challenges for AMMs to overcome. We certainly, or I, I don't want to speak for the company here. I would say I personally don't think a vanilla limit order book like the one we've implemented today is good enough to be like the final form of DeFi liquidity. But I think it's a much better starting point than the AMM. I think the AMM design space is fairly restricted, especially when you're on uh, Ethereum mainnet. Uh, I do expect to see a lot more innovation in DEX design as more and more uh DeFi activity on the Ethereum side moves to L2s, and I'm pretty excited to, to see that. So you mentioned MEV there. I was actually hoping to peel that back an additional layer. There's a there's a few differences between MEV on Solana and MEV on Ethereum. Uh, first, blocks are usually built continuously on Solana as opposed to built discreetly. And so concretely what that means is as transactions are coming in to the leader of or the proposer of the block, they're sort of building the block on the fly. Whereas uh, on the Ethereum side, say the previous block was committed at time t equals zero, all these transactions, all this private order flow builds up until say like t equals 11.9 seconds, and then the next block comes out at at the 12 second. So this block is built in this very discrete way. Now, I'm not sure if this is always going to be the case for Solana. but it does really reduce the amount of MEV that is exposed. 
Uh, so when, when we come to the dex design now in particular, there's a there's like a few forms of MEV that really harm the AMM. And when I say harm, I, I, I'm not talking about like necessarily to makers or to takers, but sort of you have this DEX ecosystem, which is comprised of makers and takers and say the, the protocol itself. And then you have this base layer the so, so where the MEV is accruing to, and that's sort of extracted from this, from this isolated system. And so on Ethereum today, uh, you know, Uniswap loses hundreds of millions of dollars, perhaps billions of dollars per year to the base layer, which is partially MEV that's, that is toxic to the makers, partially MEV that is toxic to the takers, and obviously a big portion of it is just gas fees as well. Uh, and so kind of the goal for a protocol designer is to make that number as small as possible. So the faster block times help a lot. Having active liquidity helps a lot because the makers can move their quotes themselves as opposed to having the uh, having like a toxic taker come and fix your quotes for you, where the surplus value doesn't actually end up with the taker because it's competitive, it actually ends up going to the base layer. Uh, and then some of the, like, you know, sandwich attacks are not really a thing in, in TradFi. Front running, uh, if not regulated away, can still be pretty bad for takers. Uh, but not nearly to the extent that it is with sandwich attacks. Sandwich attacks are uniquely enabled by this two-sided liquidity that we see with AMMs. Um, and so we sort of expect there to be far less MEV on limit order books. Now, that being said, uh, we're certainly not like declaring victory on, on this question. I think there are a ton of open questions related to Solana MEV, some of which we've written up and posed on the... Uh, Umbra research site. The, the 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 competition today on Ethereum and maybe is much more sophisticated than it is on the Solana side, and so I don't think we can say too concretely with a ton of evidence that uh, you know the externalities of MEV when DeFi becomes much more competitive on Solana, those could still be like crippling to the chain. We just don't have the evidence to to show that it's uh, that it is or it's not right now. And so there's a lot of research work that still needs to be done to, to, to make the chain robust to, to more sophisticated greedy actors showing up. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, one of the, I definitely recommend Umber Research to the, to the listeners here. That you guys have done some incredible work there. We'll put a link to the sh- in, the, in the show notes to that, uh, at least to the Twitter page, if nothing else. But um, I want to so you earlier you mentioned that there's uh, like sex to dex arbitrage. And instead of going like, uh, you know, say Ethereum to arbitrage, uh, like, dex to dex between ethereum and arbitrum it goes like between binance and like the market maker kind of becomes this bridge like why is that and yeah i just like why is it not really dex to dex but more like using binance as a central point and bouncing between yeah so this is one of many areas where i think a lot of the discourse has been informed by this uh, path dependency in the past so MEV originally uh, really was thought of as an atomic thing. When you go to like the very early days, 2019, 2020, sort of uh, coinciding with this original booming of DeFi. If you think about the type of person that was a searcher or, you know, really likely to be playing on chain in 2019 and early 2020, they were uh, far more likely to be like engineers and hackers and much less likely to be, you know, finance guys. And so here, the the atomicity guarantees actually make a lot of a lot of sense. Where, yeah, your trade might be a little bit worse, but your worst case is really really bounded. You don't need to understand how to hedge out your risk on Binance. You don't need to do inventory management. Um, there's like a lot that goes into sex to dex uh, stat arb. And yeah, I think there was a lot of like leaning into this you know atomic narrative where actually the stat our sex deck side was has always been growing uh we did a piece on this where we looked at some of the numbers uh, on frontier research where uh yeah we looked at the market share of sex dex arbitrage versus atomic arbitrage on chain on ethereum mainnet and for the liquid pairs so for like 
tokens that are in the top 100 by market cap, almost all of the MEV that's extracted is done in the sex to dex way. And the fundamental reason for that is because there is far better liquidity on Binance than there is on a Uniswap or a Sushi Swap. So usually what is happening in one of the, there, there's two ways these sex to dex moves can occur. The first one is someone makes a big trade on chain. So they move the price of a pool, and so now that the price of that pool is no longer in sync with uh, the Binance price. So someone is going to come in and fix that price, and then they can either hedge atomically on chain, or they can hold a little bit of risk and hedge it out later off chain uh, with the understanding that, yeah, you're going to hold on to some risk, but maybe the total cost to hedge is lower. So you can bid a little bit more in these um, bundle auctions that are happening off chain. Uh, so this is sort of the backrunning case. And then the other the other way one of these sex to dex opportunities can open up, obviously, is if the price on Binance moves. So the price on Binance moves, even if all the prices on chain are still in line with each other, there's not going to be an atomic ARB that's opened up, but all of the prices sort of need to be fixed to go to the price on the, the, the new quote unquote correct price on Binance. Uh, and there's a lot of nuance here, like what do we even mean by price discovery? What do we mean by correct price? Um, but really what the trader cares about is where they can hedge out and how much how much size they can hedge out. And this is a pretty sophisticated operation where you care about, okay, so I, I tried to do this trade. I have some probability that, I, that I'm going to get filled. At some point, I know I got filled. Then I might have to move inventory around if I don't have a ton between the chain and and the Binance or whatever centralized venues or other venues I'm hedging out on. Maybe I'm even hedging via OTC. Uh, maybe I'm hedging via futures. So this is just like this really um, intensive operation. And yeah, a lot of it is figuring out how to play these on-chain games. But I think in general, especially after... Uh, the merge where well, we went from proof of work to proof of stake. And then we entered this PBS world. There's a lot less like pure on-chain alpha and more of this like uh, MEV supply chain, as I like to say, is doing this stuff that is off-chain. Like how do we figure out what is the fair price for ETH USDC or uh, how much, you know, how much am I willing to take um, uh, some amount of risk and there are already a bunch of types of companies that are really good at this. And it's not necessarily going to be these crypto native MEV shops. It's actually going to be these trading firms that have been doing this for 20, 30 years. Yeah. And that like kind of coincides with the launch of Uniswap X and their like RFQ style um, release. And so we're kind of seeing this mini narrative play out that it's like, yeah, so we need to do, we need like sophisticated actors to perform, you know, this action off chain. And then let's see if we can like bring that back and create an efficient market on chain. Do you think we can like get to a point where we can have price discovery on chain with like the liquidity and like the DEX construction? Like, is that, is that a possible end state here? I think it's, possible that's certainly our goal is to build a venue where yeah at least to some degree price discovery happens uh right now first of all there is already a lot of price discovery on chain it's just in these all these tokens that um binance hasn't listed uh, which is the vast majority of tokens but not the majority of tokens by market cap or, or, tr or trading volume or anything like that and we would love to be in a world eventually where uh for all the major tokens and major assets not just uh, crypto native tokens right uh, as much of that price discovery is happening on chain as possible. And what you need for that is a couple things. First of all, like as much of the, um, the non-toxic flow is, is occurring, um, on chain. So this comes back to like providing competitive products that are better than the centralized alternatives. Um, with regards to Uniswap, I think there's a couple ways to look at it, right? So they, they've had a, they've had these two big product announcements. One of them is Uniswap V4, and one of them is Uniswap X. Um, Uniswap V4 is introducing these hooks on top of the V3 model, but uh, you get a lot of the primitives that Uniswap V3 had for free. So I think it really does re like uh, reduce the barrier to innovation on the Ethereum DEX side. I'm not sure how much room there really is there, especially on Ethereum Mana in this capital, oh, sorry, this uh, compute constrained world. 
uh, I think there might be some really interesting stuff that happens, say, on uh, on Arbitrum Uniswap V4. Uh, and another way you could look at it is, you know, Uniswap has been trying for five years to build a fully on-chain DEX that is sustainable and competitive, and they couldn't figure it out, so they're hoping someone else will figure it out through these through these APIs and this lower cost of innovation. You know, Uniswap X introduces this off-chain component. Uh, they they call it the the relayer. Uh, so essentially, the user will submit an intent, uh, which is effectively a signature that allows someone else to take the signature, put it on chain under some constraints. Uh, with these limit orders where the price sort of decays over time. And I think from an architectural perspective, this makes some sense. But when you really look into the details, it just starts to make less sense. With these like 12 second block times, your Dutch auction is just not going to be that efficient. Uh, I don't think there's anything Uniswap can do if they're sticking with Ethereum mainnet. I think this might look a lot better, uh, again, on an L2. Um, and then they also have this permission, like totally permissioned RFQ system that lives on top of it. That's actually, so if you go to app.uniswap.org and you turn on Uniswap X, the thing you're hitting first is not Uniswap X. You actually end up hitting their permissioned RFQ first. And this is like a set of five or six professional market makers that are giving you a quote. Uh, and then whoever wins whoever gives you the best quote, if you accept it, then it's their responsibility to land your trade on chain. And this really feels like giving up on price discovery on chain, where you're saying, all right, we can't do it. So Wintermute is going to find the best price on Binance or any other, you know, jump trading or whoever else is going to find the best price on Binance. And they're going to return that to the user and sort of be this bridge between the, the chain or Uniswap X and and Binance. And I mean, I don't know what else they could have done. Uh, and it also does very neatly solve the routing problem for them. But I think this is going to net be like quite good for the takers because, yeah, the system is just probably going to be far more efficient than swapping in these Uniswap V3 or Uniswap V4 pools. And it's going to be very likely bad for the LPs who have already been in this terrible situation for years, uh, they're going to get much less of the non-toxic flow. And essentially, you're only going to, if you're an LP, you're only going to get the flow that Wintermute doesn't want. Uh, that's not really a great place to be in. What does that look like for the protocol? Like, did it, uh, you know, obviously when trades get routed through their pools, their LPs accrue fees, but in the world where like every trade is hitting the, the first pass through the RFQ system and Wintermutes or whoever these actors are, are, uh, you know, filling these trades probably through sexes, then like, you know, does do you think we see a significant decrease in Uniswap volume because all of that stuff is being, all that volume is being moved off chain? Yep. So you will lose all the non-toxic flow or a decent chunk of the non-toxic flow. You will lose a bunch of the back running flow, which one could argue maybe shouldn't really exist anyway. Uh, that's also an artifact of poor protocol design, this double-sided liquidity. Um. But you will still have all of the toxic flow. You'll have all of the arbitrage flow. That is still going to go straight to the chain. So the situation, yeah, it's going to be a lot worse for for LPs, no doubt about it. Um, because, yeah, the takers are going to get a better deal because a more competitive liquidity provider is, is stepping in through this centralized system. So again, when we think about um, you know, Solana versus Ethereum, I have a lot of sympathy for the Uniswap team because they're developing in this world that is so constrained, uh, where if you want efficiency, you have to introduce these off-chain systems. And Uniswap is definitely not the only one who, who, who's doing something like this. Uh, and on the Solana side, you know, we want to enable active liquidity because we fundamentally believe that, yeah, we want Wintermute and Jump to be competing to give the best prices to the takers. That's sort of how uh, competition and liquidity works in traditional finance, and it works quite well. So we just think all of that should happen on chain, as opposed to on some uh, Uniswap centralized server somewhere else that doesn't really give you any guarantees on on execution. There's a lot that is going to be very difficult to audit, like uh, like fill rates or 
what the what the auctions tend to look like, or if there's any collusion between the RFQ providers. Uh, you just won't be able to tell. Uh, and yeah, I feel like that's just reverting to a completely centralized world. And if you're going to do that, you might as well just put an order book off chain. I don't see why you need to go through this, you know, jump through all these hoops to to make this um, RFQ system happen. Yeah, that's actually a good point that I hadn't considered. It's kind of like the same same sacrifices, but getting degraded performance <laughs> going the other route. But um, you tweeted a while ago uh, agreeing with Zaki, like when he tweeted, like, oh, like the time is now for the Cosmos to really, you know, start innovating and building dApps that people want to use to keep up with Ethereum and its kind of L2 centric roadmap. Um, is that the reason that you kind of started building Phoenix? You're kind of like, the time is now, let's build a really good spot decks. Like there needs to be a really good one that everyone goes to on Solana. Well, I think this realization came to me later, uh, at least as it relates to Solana. But I do agree with the general point that a lot of these roadmaps are converging. You see Ethereum moving towards this this like combination of of app chains, but also with, with shared sequencers and whatnot, which if you can solve some of these fairly difficult problems around interoperability, you might get a lot of the like the benefits of both the app chain as well as the benefits of uh, composability on the monolithic chain. And you know, I think Solana's engineering is is very, very strong relative to the the competition out there. But it doesn't matter how good your infrastructure is if you don't have users, if you don't have applications that are differentiated, right? Because the Ethereum world has pretty much all of the mind share. It has pretty much all of the capital, uh, both like dollar capital as well as social capital. And the only way that you can drive a wedge into that is by having products that are so differentiated from their counterparts. And so this is why I fundamentally don't think like a new Aave clone in 2023 or a new Uniswap clone in 2023, yeah, the fees are going to be lower. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit more efficient because the block times are shorter. Uh, It's probably not going to be enough to bring Solana over the line. I think you need a lot of products or maybe just one like super, super good product that is actually only possible to build on Solana because of the high throughput, because of the low fees. And and yeah, I think if if I could like wave the hand of God and allocate the resources among the Solana protocol developer community, I think yeah, we probably want way more like wacky experiments in the protocol design space and fewer clones of things that we're designed in 2018. We're designed to be super safe on Ethereum mainnet. We're designed, uh, again, in this heavily constrained world that where, where all these constraints are just lifted on, on Solana. The performance is going to get better on the Ethereum side with these L2s uh, as the engineering gets better with, uh, you know, ZK EVM and, and, and the proving and whatnot. And if the actual like protocol innovations are always coming from the Ethereum side, it doesn't matter if the engineering is, is stronger on Solana. It doesn't matter if the fees are better on Solana because if uh, yeah, if Solana is always just if the Solana protocols are always just copying the Ethereum protocols, there's never going to be a real differentiator. What are some of those like applications that you would love to see get built? Like what is it about like what is it about you know the Solana architecture that specifically lets you build something else that you'd like to see built on Solana? If that makes sense. Yeah, I think uh, I can like vaguely point to a couple of things. Um, you know, if I if if I knew like exactly what the killer app was going to be for crypto, um, you know, we would definitely be all in on that. Uh, I think on the DeFi side, there's. Uh, so like having active markets for everything, I think is a clear improvement. Now you need to find a way to make this translate into an improvement for the end user as well, who is probably the the swapper. But we have seen a lot of this to Solana's credit already in the past with uh, like derivatives, DEXs that are order book based and fully on chain, like Mango Markets and, and a few others, uh, spot DEXs like Serum, like Phoenix, uh, Open Book. Um, I think we can see a lot more interesting stuff happen on the margining side where yeah, most of the, most of the margin models are still essentially clones of Aave. You can probably get away from this, uh, 
uh, interest rate as a piecewise linear function of pool utilization, you can probably get to a much more efficient model that is just market-based because you have the bandwidth to implement markets, market mechanisms. So you should be able to end up with much more efficient um, borrowing and lending. So that means more capital efficiency throughout the ecosystem. Um, I think on the NFT side, this is not something that I've explored too much, but if you think about what an NFT really is, it's sort of this ownable piece of code, right? It's like a piece of code that lives on chain. It's ownable, it's transferable. Maybe it's modifiable. And to date, pretty much the design space for NFTs has been restricted to, we have this Turing complete piece of code, but all we ever do with it is have a URL that points to some JPEG that lives on Amazon S3. It seems like there's a lot more you can do with that, uh, especially when you're not too constrained by 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 uh, computational limits. So I'd like to see a little bit more like experiments there at least. What can you do with these ownable pieces of code? Can you like have them interact with each other, interact with the chain in some way um, that is not just you know ten thousand pixelated pictures? Seems like we could probably do better. Yeah, no, that's, I'm always yelling about the same thing. It's like, you know, I love the idea of uh, the interchain scheduler from the Cosmos 2, Atom 2.0 white paper. They just like, we're like, all right, let's create a, essentially a block space futures market. And this is how we'll use NFTs in a very interesting way, right? Because the right to uh, order the transaction in, in a given block is, of course, non fungible with every block being unique. So I, I would love to see uh, just the whole industry from like in developers on every chain be like, all right, well, Maybe that's a more use case, uh, a better, more interesting use case for, for NFTs. Um, so hopefully we can continue trend trending in that direction. But uh, I kind of want to steer things back towards MEV. And I, I know actually one of the pieces you wrote, um, if not two actually, for Umber Research, are kind of like on this topic. And I want to get your take. So MEV in Ethereum obviously gets re redistributed to the ETH stakers, and this is all through like the MEV, MEV boost um, supply chain that's, you know, Flashbots has kind of, you know, really implemented into the system now. Um, do you think that's like a net positive for the chain? Is that the best way to be extracting and redistributing value? Uh, or do you think like Solana kind of has the opportunity to recreate and reconstruct a different mechanism that's maybe more beneficial for the chain? Yes, I think there are a lot of areas for improvement on the MEV policy side. Uh, someone on the uh, Ethereum side described this to me really, really clearly, which was Ethereum has sort of psyopsed everyone on the chain into agreeing with this vision of this hyper-capitalist base layer, and then almost this communist protocol layer on top, where the base layer is like, okay, for it to be uh, maximally extractive. And at the protocol layer, uh, you know, if you even want to take like a small fee, people will get really, really pissed at you. And with like the Uniswap example, we see, you know, a lot of people opposed to Uniswap turning the fee switch on. But, you know, Uniswap today is returning hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars per year to Ethereum holders and Ethereum stakers. And yeah, the problem here is this is just not going to be sustainable. So you need to find a way to like really reduce the amount of MEV, which you know V4 and Uniswap X uh, are are doing while trading off maybe uh, the level of decentralization that Uniswap has always had. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting ways you can think about the redistribution. The challenge is making sure that everything is still incentive compatible, and like one really nice property of all the MEV returning to the base layer. Uh, and you know, burning the base fees, um, and you know, MEV smoothing if that if that ever goes through, and PBS is you end up having very very little skill running a validator, and you can run a competitive validator with low skill, which means you don't have the centralizing MEV force at the validator layer. Now, in practice, how centralizing is it? I'm not sure we actually know. Uh, I think there are there's like a lot of evidence that when a player ends up looking like they're going to become really big, they're going to self-limit. I think we've seen this before uh, with Bitcoin mining when uh, 
you know, mining pools really, really don't want to get to like 40% of the hash rate because then Bitcoin becomes very, very fuddable. Uh, you don't want, uh, today we see like block builders in the PBS block markets. Uh, th- there's some evidence that uh, some of the larger builders are self-limiting the their market share because, yeah, it kind of looks bad if one block builder has 70% of the share. So uh, how, how important is really making sure validators are low skill? I'm not sure, but I think that's a question that's worth exploring. That's sort of been accepted as almost dogmatic in the Ethereum world that you just have to have to turn this economic incentive to as close to zero as, as possible in a way that very conveniently also benefits people's ETH bags. Uh, but the, the thing is, like, we don't have a great solution. We don't know exactly uh, what to do. I think if you just allow the validators to extract all the MEV, keep it for themselves, and it's a very high skill game, yeah, you probably do end up with just like the biggest trading firms in the world. Uh, running all of the validators, or at least having the yeah the most sophisticated validators, I'm not sure if that's a fantastic end result either. So I mean, there's a lot of trade-offs here. Uh, I think there's a lot of design decisions to think through, uh, but we almost certainly can improve at least on the sustainability side. Um, the current situation that we see on Ethereum, which is almost like dystopian in my in my opinion. In terms of uh, Fire Dancer, is it going to have a an impact on uh, Phoenix directly? And also, like, how significant are you expecting the performance enhancements to be? So I haven't been following along the Fire Dancer developments um, too closely. My sense is they're really optimizing every part of the validator, from uh, you know even from the networking layer to uh, all, all the way down to like execution and and consensus and signature verification and whatnot. They're like really looking at every component and trying to optimize it all the way down. Uh, as far as impact, I think you should end up with even higher throughput and even lower fees in the steady state. Um, now, it kind of depends how many, like what percent of the stake weight moves over to Fire Dancer. Because if less than two thirds does, then... Uh, you know, everyone else on the chain is still going to have to be able to to keep up. So maybe you can't just crank the throughput up a factor of 10. Um, but if everyone is running Fire Dancer, presumably you could, yeah, just crank everything up by a factor of 10, by a factor of 100. What that means, practically speaking, is, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're still in this world where you have continuous block building, and I imagine Fire Dancer is, is you know, still going to be implementing their own default scheduler, it, there's, there's no way that yeah, it, it seems very likely to still involve continuous block building. We should we should just see like a lot more efficiency on the order books themselves. Uh, and I think uh, probably some of these latency games that are already getting played on the MEV side will become more important, which is definitely not ideal, but I think it's also this natural evolution of how financial markets go. So as it goes to like the Ethereum narratives, right? They've spent a lot of effort really focusing on like ETH is money. And because of this, it makes a supreme type of collateral. And now you see like, you know, obviously staking, staking derivatives have taken off and Lido staked ETH is like this new prime collateral that's kind of, you know, if you look at uh, like Aave backing or Aave collateral, Curve USD, you know, and down the list, wrap staked ETH is like by far the largest asset. And when you look at the Solana side of things, there's been like almost the opposite idea of, you know, like Anatoly being like, Hey, Solana's not money. It's you simply need a small amount to pay transaction fees. And that's how you participate in the network. But like the assets, not money. Do you think that like, that's been a part of the reason why DeFi maybe has been a little bit slower to take off on Solana, just because you don't have that like one asset that is prominent to be used in DeFi and like people can rely on to be this like form of, you know, digital money. No, I don't agree with that. I think the the money narrative is is really overblown on the Ethereum side. I think it's uh, just a pretty cynical way to capture some of this monetary premium. Uh, and really, the the main argument for oh, Ethereum is money is just that it's an asset that has any sort of business model whatsoever. Which, to be fair, is very rare in crypto. It might be like the only one that has a sustainable, somewhat sustainable business model. But that certainly is not enough to make an asset money. I think it's yeah, really just this narrative push. 
I also do think on the Solana side, there is, um, you know, the, the problem on Solana DeFi is not there's like too many assets and we don't know what the dominant asset is. The problem is there's not enough assets. There's not enough stuff to do. I think Sol and USCC are totally dominant in the Solana DeFi in the same way that Ether and USCC are dominant on Ethereum DeFi. So today we have such a small market share relative to traditional markets. And, you know, that's probably very okay, right? We're still moving fast. We're still breaking things. It's not really ready to hit scale um, on any major chain today. So part of that's very okay. But if you fast forward it out, it's like, okay, well, well what moves the needle? And, you know, it's probably the applications themselves improving their tech, the base layers improving their tech. But like, what, I don't know, like, do we need tokenized T-bills or something of this nature to like, be like, okay, we have this perfect design for a lending market, but you still need that, like something to be used as collateral on chain. Yeah, it's a, uh, I think real world assets are this deal with the devil. You already see this with Circle and Tether, which basically are, you know, this real world asset that's been bridged on chain. And the problem is the same as all the other bridge assets we already see in crypto. The problem is this dependency on the bridge. So with the real world asset, uh, at least like a, you know, a tokenized wrapped asset, like, a, I don't know, you want to bring some real estate on chain by tokenizing it and splitting it up and sending some of the revenue to the, the, the token holders. The, the problem is this bridge is this really, really important central piece of infrastructure and its importance only gets bigger and bigger. For example, today, like effectively, anytime Ethereum wants to do a hard fork, Circle and Tether have a veto over it. I don't think they've ever exercised this. And if they did, they would certainly do it in private. They're probably like really not incentivized to do this ever. But if push comes to shove and Circle says, hey, like I'm not going along with this upgrade, uh, there's not too much Ethereum can do, right? Because the like Circle gets to decide which version of USDC, which fork it is accepting uh, for creations and redemptions. So if all of your USDC on your quote unquote canonical chain goes to zero, that just like totally destroys the ecosystem. So having more of a reliance on real world assets, I think is this scary proposition. You sort of just end up with a bunch of other actors having a lot of, uh, yeah, a bunch of centralized, potentially censorable, um, very likely censorable actors with a lot of influence over the chain in this way that's maybe uh, not as easy to quantify as, oh, someone controlling 33% of the stake or 66% of the stake. Uh, it's really this sort of political power that they, that they have over the chain. Do you have opinions on this is kind of right field too, but do you have opinions on decentralized stable coins? Cause you know, you say it's kind of unfortunate tether circle, et cetera, have like kind of a stranglehold over choosing Ethereum upgrades. So curious if you have any strong opinions there. Uh, I think it would be great if we could make one that worked. I haven't seen a design that I think works yet. Uh, and we've seen a lot of designs that don't work. Uh, it's, it seems really difficult for stable coin, a decentralized stablecoin to scale. I'll say that. I think that's the, the biggest issue we see today. Uh, and then you sort of get back to this question of, can we have another asset as the money asset? And this is where the actual value of, of that comes in, where we say like, hey, if we can sort of socially meme everybody into not caring about dollars and into caring about some other asset, then we can make that asset crypto native, whether it's BTC or Ether or something else. Um, but that also requires consolidation and, you know, if, if there's no consolidation, the very natural shelling point is us dollars, which is the currency around the world that the vast majority of people prefer, prefer to hold. So coming up with some sort of decentralized version of it that like, you know, follows it reasonably, I think is, is a very noble mission. I just don't know if it's, if it's possible with, with the tools we have today. Yeah, I completely agree and share your views on that topic. But uh, Eugene, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thanks so much for coming on. You're like clearly like just you've got you've got research on very wide array of subjects that we'll also link in the, the show notes. So you kind of got your hands in a lot of different pots. It's incredibly impressive and, and it was fun to have a chat. But do you want to share with the audience where uh, they can find you learn more more, more about uh, just what you're up to? Uh, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at zero X shit trader. You can follow uh, our company, Ellipsis Labs, 
at ellipsis underscore labs. And if you are more interested in the research side, uh, we post some stuff at Umbra Research. Awesome. Thanks a ton, Eugene. It's been a great call. I appreciate it, man. Cheers.